This is The Reason Interview with Nick Gillespie. Today's guest is Maverick journalist Glenn Greenwald, whose work publicizing Edward Snowden's revelations of ubiquitous and illegal surveillance of Americans helped The Guardian win a Pulitzer Prize. Greenwald now hosts the nightly news show System Update on Rumble, and he maintains an active presence on X. We talked about the failing fortunes of The Intercept, the investigative website he co-founded in 2014 and had an acrimonious break with in 2020. The Israel-Gaza war, student protests on campuses, legacy media's obsession with mis- and disinformation, and whether a victory by Joe Biden or Donald Trump would be worse for America and the world. This interview was conducted before a live audience in New York City, a day after Greenwald debated Alan Dershowitz at the Soho Forum about whether the United States should attack Iran's nuclear program. Here is The Reason Interview with Glenn Greenwald. So, uh, Glenn, thanks for talking to Reason. I guess, out of the box, let me ask you, how good does it make you feel to read stories about The Intercept going out of business? I try very unsuccessfully to hide my glee over those stories. First of all, thank you for inviting me and for having this event. I feel like I've ever since the beginning of my career in journalism, I've ended up talking to you once every two to three years. And I used to resist it. I used to try and hide from you. And you were very (laughs) persistent. And then at some point I was like, let me just stop resisting and accept it. It's just part of my life for whatever reason. So I'm glad to be you, with uh, you. You sound a lot like my fiance right now. <laughs> she and I should talk. Um, mm. But yeah, yeah, so I, you know, I did have, I mean, when I created The Intercept, it was at the height of the Snowden story. Mm-hmm. We had the biggest story in the world, myself and Laura Poitras. We created The Intercept with Jeremy Scale in a very specific set of missions, one of which was to create a new kind of media outlet. I was at The Guardian. There's no reason I would leave just to go and replicate what was already being done. Um, And the idea were things like we were never going to be attached to a political party. We were going to be highly adversarial to the factions that the media had become far too friendly with and deferential to, particularly the U.S. security state. And most of all, we wanted to be a journalist driven media outlet. So you have editors that you pick, but they're not there to impede you or to tell you when you can and can't publish, but to help you make your story better. Because at the end of the day, when you put your name on something, the one who suffers of the story isn't good as you. And so you kind of have that responsibility. Mm -hmm. None of those ended up happening um, until we got to the point where in 2020, I wanted to write a story, a set of stories about what I thought the documents from Hunter Biden's laptop revealed, not about Hunter Biden's personal life. I had no interest in that. I thought that was totally relevant. It was about instead the efforts of the Biden family to trade on Joe Biden's name and influence in places like Ukraine, which he basically ran as vice president and also in China for profits. And they told me I couldn't write about it because there was no proof the documents were authentic. I spent my career authenticating large Mm archives of stories and um, all the indicia that led us to authenticate those prior ones that I published with The Intercept were at least as much present in the Hunter Biden story. But like so much in the media, what had happened was in 2016, we did a lot of critical reporting about both Trump and Hillary Clinton, meaning we did our jobs as journalists. And when Trump won, I remember there was actual weeping in the virtual newsroom of Slack and people saying, oh, how, do you, how do you weep virtually with like emojis? Like, yeah, emojis or you like, right, I'm actually okay. literally weeping. Yeah. Um, there are yeah. ways like okay. just saying, for example, I'm weeping and then putting yeah. a bunch of like crying emojis and you could feel the trauma. And people said, I think we need to apologize for the role we played. And I was like, what role did we play? We yeah. did our jobs and reporting on both. But ever since then, liberal outlets became petrified of ever again being accused of doing anything to help Donald Trump. And as a result, they embraced as their primary mission, subordinating journalistic values and everything else, the mission of stopping Trump. And so for me, as kind of the face of The Intercept, to have published reporting on the Joe Biden laptop documents um, would risk that these senior editors at The Intercept would again be accused by their liberal friends of again helping Trump. And that was why they wouldn't let me. I mean, that was kind of a broadly observed reaction, right, to Trump winning a lot of people in what we now call liberal or legacy media or corporate media. I saw people leaving The Intercept saying, like, I've got to get away from corporate media. And it's kind of weird. Like, it doesn't seem that way. But um, what is what is driving that? Is it that the reporting class sees itself as an adjunct, not just to power or elites, but to a specific subset of that, which are 
what we would tend to call liberal uh, progressive elites or, you know, what, what, why is there that tight identification with the idea that, you know, Donald Trump winning over Hillary Clinton was such a seismic event then that we have to do everything possible to make sure it doesn't happen again. I think one of the, there are two major changes, both of which I think are highly detrimental for media. One is the corporatization of media. Mm -hmm. So you go back and look at some of the iconic newsrooms and I don't want to romanticize the past of journalism. There was lots of things wrong with it. You know, Henry Luce, the owner of Time Magazine was extremely close to the CIA and would do their mm -hmm. propaganda. But, you know, in general, newsrooms were independently owned and the people who were attracted to journalism were outsiders, just outsiders in their comportment. They usually came from the working class. They were working class. They had mm -hmm. guilds and they had um, union jobs. You could look at these pictures of these kind of old school journalists and they're kind of very slovenly. They have like, you know, ink stained fingers. I, uh, I, uh, I wish we still could pull that off. Yeah, I mean, you know? and that's, that's I, the I problem. I have to work to keep this together. Yeah, yeah, I mean, but you know, when you corporatize a profession, it means no. that you impose corporate values and that means that all the values that corp that you need to thrive in any corporation, which generally means not disrupting mm -hmm. the status quo, not alienating people, not defending people, then translates into journalism and those are the worst conformist values or the worst possible values to so important journalism. So when did journalism. that happen? You know, because I'm thinking But, people, but I don't mean to say cuz I also think specifically as bad as that already was, once Trump got elected, there was this incredible psychological trauma for American liberals. I mean, mm. there were really stories of like therapists saying, I'm, I can't I have any more patients because they're all like neurotic and, and yeah. unhinged because Trump won. That was a real thing. Um, I do think they got very much more explicit about the fact mm. that there now is this sort of overarching transcendent mission of journalists that didn't mm. exist before, which is to save American democracy. And anything you do in defense of that mission, even lying, spreading disinformation, abandoning your journalistic mission becomes justified because the objective mm. is so overarching. Did you vote in 2016? And if you did, who'd you vote for? I don't, I don't vote just because I don't like to be tied even okay. psychologically to one of the Were campaigns. you worried that Trump was an, uh, an extinction level threat to democracy? No, um, in part because his opponent was Hillary Clinton. And okay, explain that a little bit. Well, I mean, Hillary Clinton was at the center of pretty much every single disaster of American foreign policy and just like of the, you know, sleazy way of doing mm. DC politics. I mean, they were surrounded by corrupt money, corporate money. They monetized their post-presidential life in a way that nobody had. She um, wrote a book in which she was critical of Obama, not because he expanded all of the Bush Cheney war on terror and foreign policy policy uh, planks that he ran in 2008 based on a promise to uproot and then strengthened, but because he didn't do enough of that. She wanted more confrontation mm. with the Russians and Syria. She wanted more confrontation with the Russians in Ukraine. She essentially now is somebody who loves war as much as Lindsey Graham does. Mm. And so I saw her as an, in some ways as a much greater threat because unlike Donald Trump, who's so out of the box in terms of just comportment, you know, and I knew that he was going to trigger this intense resentment on the part of every American elite sector, whereas Hillary Clinton is like the living, breathing yeah. embodiment of American elite power. And she would have very little resistance to do what she wanted to do. And I do think ultimately Trump was a very weak president. So much of what he said he would do, he didn't. He ended up not doing. He ended up hiring all kinds of people who were completely the opposite of the ideology he claimed to embrace. Um, there were generals who boasted about the fact that they would ignore his orders as commander in chief, like withdrawing troops from Syria. And they found ways not to do it and were celebrated yeah. by the media for having thwarted Trump when I can't think of a worse threat to democracy than generals right. ignoring the civilian leadership. So, of where, so where, all those things. OK, where where does that come from in on the, the part of a, you know, kind of a mainstream media? Because um, that that was stunning. And we learned later that, uh, you know, various people in the military were lying about the number of U.S. troops that were stationed in various places to Donald Trump. And one would think that is an absolute like horror. That's a sin. Why don't why don't liberal slash progressive media people get upset about that? I think that because they're not I mean, they're not warmongers. No, no. Stretch, they, right? they, but they they don't. I think what happened is and this is part of what we were talking about mm -hmm. earlier where most liberal journalists now all come from Harvard. And, you know, I would hear so much about diversifying the newsroom. Mm -hmm. 
And then we would hire, you know, more racial minorities. We would hire people with uh, other uh, sexual orientation and gender ideologies, and you would diversify them that way. But they still all came from the exact small number of elite schools. They all had parents who grew up as, you know, Goldman Sachs partners or law firm partners. So it was diversified in every way on the surface, except socioeconomically. And so you have this complete integration of the journalistic class, especially on the national level, not so much on the local one, but on the national level, completely integrated into the elite establishment system they're supposed to be adversarial to. And so they talk only to each other, for each mm. other. They constantly hear only from one another. And I think they really became convinced they just fed on this constant daily diet that Trump was like a basically a Hitler figure, that American mm. democracy was singularly imperiled by his empowerment. And they really started believing that. I mean, I know a lot of them. I watched them transform overnight into true believers of that narrative. And if you really think Trump is a Hitler figure on some level, it does kind of become justified to start lying, mm. to disseminate disinformation, to relinquish your journalistic mission in pursuit of doing everything you can to stop him. The problem, of course, is that narrative is laughable. Yeah. But within a, American elite circles, that is the dominant perception. Do you uh, do you, did you worry about Biden being elected or, and you know, I mean, is Biden as bad as Hillary Clinton or or as bad as Trump? Or is it kind of like this isn't where you find your energy anymore? I mean, I think Biden is just a very ordinary, standard, classic Washington insider. He's been a senator since he's 29 years old. Yep. He really has never done anything but D.C. politics. He's always been just kind of like in the center or the center right plank of the uh, Democratic Party. He's been a supporter of imperialism and corporatism. He comes from Delaware, where banks and corporations and credit card companies are. He's always defended them over consumers. You know, I didn't think he was particularly uniquely anything. Um, I just thought he was a standard continuation of the status quo, and I think that's more or less what he what he's become. I guess uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, Julian Assange, uh, who you've uh, tweeted about a little bit recently. Why is it bad for Assange to be extradited to the United States? So I'll tell you this story. I Julian Assange, a friend of mine, I visited him in the Ecuadorian embassy where the CIA spied on us, and there's videotape of that happening and part of lawsuits. But he, I think, is probably the singular figure who is the most pioneering and innovative and consequential journalist of our generation. And the fact that he has been imprisoned effectively for more than a decade, despite having never been convicted of a crime other than the misdemeanor of bail jumping, which is when he sought asylum in the Ecuadorian embassy, um, is kind of shocking when you think about it. But I'll just tell you a quick story, which was at the beginning of WikiLeaks, when they first did the Iraq and Afghanistan war logs, mm -hmm that revealed a lot of secret, previously secret war crimes and the diplomatic cables. Somebody who was a very integral to WikiLeaks, who was a very wealthy person from a Northern European country came to Brazil where I was and met with me. And he said he was pulling out of WikiLeaks because they had become obviously extremely, not just controversial, but persecuted by various governments. And what he told me was, and it's kind of amazing as an American to hear people in like Western Europe, Europe thinking this and saying this, he said, my greatest fear is not that my own government is gonna knock on my door. I don't have any fear of that. I believe in the rights and the protections that they would give me. My greatest fear is that my government's gonna knock on my door and say, we're turning you over to the Americans and I'm gonna end up in the American justice system. And, you know, I remember feeling kind of amazed by that. Like the last place you ever wanna be is the American justice system when you're accused of national security mm -hmm. crimes. And then once I got heavily involved with Snowden, I saw, you know, there are laws that are written like the Espionage Act of 1917 by Woodrow Wilson designed to criminalize dissent of the U.S. role in World War I. They called it espionage if you even hand a single secret yep. over. It was what Daniel Osberg was charged with, and he wanted to get on the stand and say, I was justified in doing it, and the court shut him down. There's no defense to it. They get put in these Eastern Virginia courtrooms where all the judges are hardcore national security hawks, and all the jurors are you know, CIA contractors and defense contracts because they live in that part of, that's where they purposely bring them, and conviction is all but guaranteed. And it is kind of odd. You think like, why does Assange keep appealing? All he's doing is lingering in a British prison. He's not getting out. But the big fear that he's always had for understandable reasons is ending up on American soil, it disappeared into an American dungeon. We have a pretty harsh prison system compared to a lot of other countries. And his conviction would be all but guaranteed. Is, uh, do you think the, uh, the that first kind of wave of WikiLeaks uh, exposés, was that, was that a major turning point in 
journalistic history, I suppose, you know, certainly in world history and things like that. And if so, what did it do? And is it really, is it really powerful or is it just kind of a flea on an elephant's back? Here's why I think it's so innovative and so consequential, because if you think about what a healthy democratic society would be, and you can go back and look at the founding documents of the United States or things that were said at the time, is you're supposed to have a government that knows almost nothing about the citizenry. We're not supposed to have a government that keeps dossiers on us. We're not supposed to have a government that knows everything about us. But that's why we're called private citizens. The only way they're supposed to know anything about us is in the rare case they go to a court and get a search warrant and then can listen on our calls. But the, the, the presumptive rule is they shouldn't know anything about us. And conversely, we're supposed to know everything about what they do. That's why they're public officials. They're public, exercising public power. And a couple of exceptions, again, when there's war, obviously, if they have troop movements or strategies, that can't be known. But the presumption is supposed to be that we know everything that they're doing. This has been completely reversed in the United States and in the West generally, so that we have, as we know, a government that has a massive indiscriminate surveillance system aimed at the American people, collecting immense amounts of information about every citizen, regardless of whether we've done anything wrong. And increasingly, they have these tools that allow them to hide everything beyond behind this wall of secrecy. When I was doing the Snowden story, and it took three years to read through you know, millions of top secret documents from our US security state, one of the things that surprised me the most was that every single document, even the most banal, like how you get a parking credential, how you apply for vacation if you work at the NSA, was just automatically marked top secret. It's like reflexively, they hide everything that they do. So it's reverse. We know nothing about what our government is doing except the theater they let us see, and they know everything about what we're doing. What WikiLeaks did was say, okay, we need a way to blow the hole through that wall of secrecy they've constructed. And what Julian Assange realized before anybody else was that the big vulnerability that they have is now that all information is stored digitally, it's very easy to just hand it out, that that is how we were going to, these big, massive leaks were the future of journalism. When Daniel Ellsberg uh, leaked the Pentagon Papers, one of his biggest challenges was, you know, how do you copy 40,000 right. pages? Like, you go to the, the, the pharmacy with a big bag of dimes yeah. and do it one by one? Right. You know, that was, a, you talked to him, and that was a major logistical problem for him. Like, he yeah. was very, he did that, by the way. That's part of what he did, and that he was scared of getting caught. Now, when Chelsea Manning you know, did her big leak to WikiLeaks. Mm -hmm. It took her about 25 minutes. She put on a Lady Gaga right. uh, CD and the information was going. And so Julian Assange's realization that all newsrooms use now is how do you allow sources inside the government to hand you massive amounts of digital information and do so anonymously so that you're protected. And some of the most important things we know about our government are directly because yeah. Julian Assange broke those stories, and that's why he's in prison. But has it changed things? And and I don't mean to, I I agree with you. I you know I find Assange's persecution you know incredibly disgusting from every possible angle. I think what he did, and I think what Snowden did, and I think what uh, a number of other people have done has been incredibly helpful. And yet here we are, uh, you know, the se Section 702 of FISA was reauthorized with essentially nothing other than a slightly longer than normal term for it. Uh, we know that the government surveillance state just keeps getting bigger and bigger. So is it, is, is it meaningful or how is it meaningful? So I'll, let's take the Snowden reporting, for example. You know, we revealed this incredibly broad, limitless system of mass warrantless surveillance directed not only at foreign adversaries, but yep. the American people. And you can say, well, look, the NSA building's still standing. They still spy, like nothing changed. But the reality is it radically changed the consciousness of people over the planet about their privacy in the digital age. So they were the ones pressuring social media companies like Facebook and Google to prove that they were protecting privacy. All but kinds we've of, also since learned that Twitter and Facebook in particular are everywhere hand. are totally in bed, either following the dictates of government or actually asking the government, should I clamp down on this type of speech? Should we report this person? For sure. If you have giant corporations, you're always yeah. going to have them working with the government. The government can give them massive uh, contracts, mm -hmm. billions of, you know, Amazon has billions of dollars of contracts yeah. with the CIA and the Pentagon. Obviously, they're going to work with them. But 
There are things And that's like, not even get bringing in the parking companies, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Dude, but it also like the NSA parking franchise. You yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Right? That's why maybe those parking yeah. credential documents were top secret. Yeah. No, I didn't think about it. But, uh, you know, but let, let's take WhatsApp, which is a company now owned by Facebook. It's the most popular chat um, platform in major countries, right. in, in Brazil, in uh, throughout Western Europe. People increasingly in the United States are using WhatsApp. And within WhatsApp, is end-to-end -end encryption, which really does make it extremely difficult for the U.S. government or any other government to invade those communications. You have encryption that has gone up by you know something like 800% in the first two years after we did the Snowden reporting. These make it much more difficult. So you know the United States is like this gigantic, massive ocean liner. You know if you want to change direction, it's not some dramatic 180 shift. Immediately you have to turn it and then turn it and then turn it and then turn it a little bit more. And so making people aware of it, divulging their secrets, having people understand a little bit better. But you're right, they, you know, establishment centers of power don't just give up easily. That's why they're establishment centers of power. They have their own tactics. And with, you know, a year of doing this noted reporting, suddenly everybody was scared of ISIS. They're worse than mm -hmm. Al Qaeda. We need to spy on them. After that, in 2016, the next year it was Russia, Russia's interfering, we need to spy on them. So they always feed the population hmm. enough threats to keep people scared and keep people, you know, when the population is scared, they want to give up more authority in the name of keep be being kept safe. So they have their own tactics, but you know, there's a back and forth at least now and, and you do what you can and hope that people will, will react. Yeah, do you feel, uh, you are primarily located now on Rumble, right? Mm -hmm. uh, can you explain what that is? And uh, let's talk a little bit about how, uh, you know, media simultaneously seems to be getting more concentrated in some, other, in some ways and then more decentralized and dispersed in others. But what is Rumble and why do you hang out there so much? Yeah, I don't just hang out there. I actually do all my journalism there. Right. Um, and the you, reason you, is... And you do your weeping there. Your <laughs> online do, weeping. Right? Right? Yeah. And the reason is, is because one of the things that has bothered me most, you know, we were talking before about who's a bigger threat to mm -hmm. American democracy, like Hillary Democrats or Biden Democrats or Trump. We now know that the Biden administration had a systematic plan in place to call up Facebook, Google, Twitter, um, and other platforms and demand the removal of dissenting information from government orthodoxies and policies. And it was so systemic mm -hmm. that a lower district court judge and then an appellate court judge, but unanimously, a appellate court panel, ruled that it was one of the most, the gravest mm -hmm. frontal assaults on the free speech rights of Americans in decades, that the government was removing dissent from the internet by threatening and cajoling mm -hmm. and even forcing these companies to do so. And so, and that Supreme Court case will be uh, the ruling on it will be announced. Yeah, and I have a feeling the Supreme that. Court's going to get out, find a way to not rule on it and mm -hmm. allow that program to stand. But on the substance, that's what four federal judges yeah. have thus far said. And so, you know, for me, when I talked to Edward Snowden the first time and tried, you know, I spent two days in Hong Kong with him, just only trying to get to his motive. Yeah. What he was telling me was, "Look, I'm the age where I." you know, kind of grew up with the internet and thought the internet was the greatest potential to liberate human beings, to enable us to organize and communicate, spread information, speak freely without relying on centralized state and government control. And so when I saw within the NSA that it was now being coerced, it was, you know, the cause that he was willing to give up his life for was a free internet. And so to me, this is the same cause when the government is increasingly, or big tech companies are increasingly limiting the range of speech, the limiting the ideas that we can express, per preserving some spaces on the internet from companies or platforms that refuse to obey this kind of you know neoliberal western structure that's constantly passing laws to let them control the flow of information which is what rumble does mm -hmm. elon musk speaks about doing that yeah. and sometimes he does it a little but rumble really means business like they've mm -hmm. lost access to france when france told them to remove rt right. and sputnik and they refused they've lost access to brazil right. because of the constant censorship orders that come from brazil and so a company that principled involved in a cause to that to me is that paramount you know i just, just i was doing very well at substack i always can work wherever but i wanted to purposely go and bring my audience to a place that is purposely you know, it's like the free speech alternative to YouTube. They have everybody on there, the right. most extreme anti-establishment leftist, hardcore far rightist, um, and everything in between. And they just refuse to intervene in that. Do you feel that um, media consumers are smarter now or more critical um, and more capable of kind of handling the truth, however they define it and however people dish it out? 
are we better, you know, we're about 30 or 40 years really into the internet era, are we better at kind of looking at massive streams of information and news and figuring out what is true and what is not? I really do trust people's ability. I mean, one of the things that excites me the most and makes me the happiest, other than the extreme financial failures and imminent collapse of The Intercept. <laughs> um, uh, don't tell anybody that I say yeah. that because I try and pretend that I'm, I'm not taking shot in their in their failures, even though I am. But the thing that gives me the most amount of hope and happiness is when I see these polls that show that everybody hates the corporate media. Mm -hmm. uh, the corporate media is less popular than pretty much every group other than yeah. pedophiles and like barely, yeah, yeah, barely yeah. above them. Yeah. And I think the reason is, is because people do have this kind of sense when they're being deceived and lied mm -hmm. to and defrauded. And when you tell, you know, people that you have a certain function and your mm -hmm. real function is wildly and radically different, even antithetical to the one that you're claiming people have, people know they're being lied to. And it's shocking how, what a low percentage of people now say that they distrust what they hear from corporate media. And in, independent media is growing rapidly. I mean, the number of people who read my articles now that I've left The Intercept compared to how many read when I was at The Intercept is so much higher in part because there are so many people now who don't trust you if you're part of some known media outlet. Um, and you know, there's a lot of people who trust certain media outlets, but in general, people really believe in independent media. And independent media is not perfect. It has no. a lot of the same temptations and flaws that corporate media has, but at least it's like a dissenting voice. It's like mm -hmm. something that is challenging orthodoxy instead of constantly parroting it. And keeping those that diversity of opinion there um, mm -hmm. is so important because the alternative is living in a closed system of government and corporate propaganda. Before we uh, go off media for a second and into a, another set of topics, what was what's your origin story in terms of what did you read that suddenly you were like, this is why I want to be a journalist. You're trained as a lawyer. You worked as a lawyer. But was there a publication or a series of publications that just spoke to you, because you, you grew up in Florida, right? Yeah, I was born in New York, grew up in Florida, uh, and then I went to uh, college in Washington, then law school in New York. Mm -hmm. And like in the 90s, you know, I graduated law school in 1994, so I started my career as a, as a lawyer then. Um, I really was so uninterested in, in politics, in mm -hmm. the sense of like partisan politics. It was like a very, you know, it was right after the Cold War mm -hmm. uh, ended, the Berlin Wall had fallen. Or uh, as some people like to say, just as World War III was beginning. Yeah, when, yeah, that was when we were gonna get our yeah. peace dividend that never happened. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, if you look at the 90s, it was dominated by just like very sleazy, low stakes scandals, like all of Bill Clinton's various mm -hmm. sex scandals. And it was always like Monica Lewinsky and Paula Jones. and you know, Bill Clinton was doing school uniforms. Mm -hmm. and I just felt like that didn't really matter. I was so much more interested in the limits that the Constitution mm -hmm. imposed on government. I just got out of law school. I right. kind of had this very, like, you know, young person's naivete about the ability to hold power accountable. So I focused a lot on my work. And then it was really after 9-11 mm -hmm. when I started seeing things that I never thought would happen in the United States, things like American citizens being arrested on U.S. soil and being imprisoned with no charges, held incognito with no access to lawyers based on a theory that the government could just decree you mm -hmm. an enemy combatant and then you were, were one and then you had no rights any longer as an American citizen to be charged with crimes, torture, mass surveillance, things that you know you could just feel. I was living in New York at the time. You could feel the transformation of the, the country, of the climate, and of the set of political rights. And I felt like there was almost no recognition of those dangers that I was hearing in the kind of you know mediocre news outlets I was consuming. I was a good reader of the New York Times and the, the Atlantic and the, the New Yorker, all the things that you think you're supposed to read if you want to be a high-end consumer. And I wasn't finding any of that mm -hmm. there. And so I started you know, paying more attention to the internet. And there was the advent of what were called blogs at the time, mm -hmm. people who were just very angry at the primarily at the media. And I saw like, wow, this is reaching a lot of people. And these are people who are expressing views you never hear within the media, especially because they were dissidents against the media from both the right and left. And I started reading them more. Um, I was a philosophy major, so I'd read a lot of, you know, political philosophy. And mm -hmm. I was always interested in that. I read a lot of like Chomsky when I start, first started in journalism or I.F. Stone, people I right. thought 
had made a big impact on politics and journalism. But I really just was more excited by the opportunity to create yeah. something different. And I just then I was reading that a lot, you know, kind of obsessively. And then I decided I wanted to it's not just passively consume that conversation, mm. but participate in it. And so just created a blog randomly yeah. in 2005 and, then, and it I took that, off from there. Yeah, got picked up by Salon and, yeah, you know, yeah. and onward. Uh, let's talk a little bit about student protests right now. We're, we're going to talk more directly about foreign policy in a second. But um, if you uh, were in, uh, you know, law school in the uh, or in college in the late '80s and the and the '90s, that was not a peak moment really for student or campus unrest. Uh, there was some of it, but what what is your sense of what's been going on in college campuses? Is this an actual serious revolt in thinking, or is this kind of pampered elite children LARPing at being radicals? I'm sure there's a lot of all of that. I mean, first mm -hmm. of all, there is a huge, important tradition of student activism, including activism far more disruptive than what we're seeing now. I mean, throughout the 60s against the Vietnam War, that turned out to be very mm -hmm. important. It prevented Lyndon Johnson from being able to run again, mm -hmm. drove him out of the Democratic Party. And in the 80s, you know, before mm -hmm. I got to college, but you mentioned it, there was a lot of activism around pressuring the United States government and universities to divest from South mm -hmm. Africa to bring down the apartheid regime, and that played a role in doing that too. Mm -hmm. There were tons of protests on campuses throughout the West against the invasion of Iraq and some of the parts of the war on terror. So to me, this is just a continuation of that tradition. And you know, one of the things that has changed when it comes to Israel and Gaza, without kind of driving, diving into the merits of it, is you know, 15 years ago when Israel would bomb Gaza, the only things we would see were the images that a handful of large corporations, media corporations, wanted us to see. Now, you know, everybody in Gaza has a telephone and they can upload the aftermath of a bomb and we can hear from, you know, the United States and Israel that 12 militants were killed and yet we see the video of babies and children yeah. being. And so, you know, I, I, I've of interviewed a lot of these. we also see the, uh, you know, what Hamas has done as well, right? Yeah, of course. I mean, I mean but we always have, yeah. you know, we, I mean, this is a very pro-Israel country. We give mm -hmm. Israel far more aid than we have to any other country right. by all, you know, we, we, we tie ourselves to them. So I don't think the problem has ever been, oh, we don't hear enough about bad things about Arab terrorists and Palestinian terrorists. I think we hear plenty of that. What we haven't heard is kind of the other side, just like, you know, with 9-11, we were told, oh, they attacked us for our freedom, not because we were right. interfering in their countries all those years. And I think, you know, if you look, I mean, you could be very naive about, or I'm very like cynical and jaded about the motives of these protesters. But to me, I think a lot of them, and I've interviewed a lot of them, are driven by watching every day the destruction and bombing of this very densely packed civilian population and watching Joe Biden, who they had a kind of image of um, that they were sold, who is arming it, defending it, financing it, paying for it. And I think a lot of them are just reacting to what they're seeing. Like, this seems like a very devastating and unjust war. And I think student activism is super healthy because the alternative is apathy or just submitting to state propaganda. Is, uh, well, here, here's a question for you. On college campuses, there's certainly a massive amount of regulation of speech, uh, most of which I think you're against. Where, All of it, you know, Certain yeah. opinions are ruled as just being out of bounds uh, for discussion and things like that. Um, you know, is this, is the debate that's happening on college campuses moving that forward or is it just, no, we are going to control all speech versus you are going to control all speech? Are we actually getting to a place where people are having meaningful, robust debates that aren't about trying to shut the other side down? One of the reasons I found a lot of new, let's say, conservative readers and viewers over the past decade is because I've been a stalwart opponent of the component of left-wing activism right. that relies on censorship, both internet censorship, campus censorship. And it's obviously a lot of that has been directed at conservative speech. But it's always been the case that one of the most frequent targets of campus censorship and censorship generally are people who are critical of Israel. There have been professors who have lost their jobs, who have been denied tenure over it. There are student groups that have never been given recognition or have been closed down because they are supporters of the Palestinian cause. It's just a reality. Mm -hmm. And I spent a lot of time trying to tell these conservatives who were like, oh, yeah, you're on our side. You're yeah. for free speech because you don't believe in censorship of right-wing speech. You know, look, there's this gigantic Israel exception that has always been on the American right. And if you want to be a real free speech proponent, that it's not as important. It's more important that you wave that banner when it comes to the ideas you most hate being targeted. Anyone can be a free speech champion for right. defending the ideas that they like. Everybody is. And, you know, I think that 
it's been kind of nauseating, like the hypocrisy has been suffocating, watching people on the right who have been mocking this left-wing script that I've been mocking as well, that, oh, students need to be safe mm -hmm. on campuses, they can't be upset by things they're hearing, running around calling everybody racist the minute you disagree with them, trying to impose speech codes, claiming that hate speech is not part of the Constitution, letting Congress dictate to mm -hmm. American colleges how administrators should and should not allow certain kinds of protests or views to be heard, to watch the same conservatives who have spent the last 10 years posturing as free speech defenders suddenly run around calling everybody a bigot or anti-Semite the minute they disagree with somebody, demanding that certain political chants not only be banned on colleges, but now in Texas, you can be subject to arrest if you chant certain political slogans. I think in the last seven months, you know, we've had an expanded definition of anti-Semitism as well on, uh, by Congress that includes a whole variety of obviously protected political speech when it comes to Israel. We've had in some way a much more effective assault on free speech in the last seven months um, in the name of stopping these protesters. And so, yeah, there's certain things these protesters have done that I dislike. I don't like blocking ingress and egress. Mm -hmm. I think that's wrong. Um, but the protests have been almost entirely peaceful, not like the CNN version of like yeah, yeah. largely peaceful protests during the Black yeah. Lives Matter, but like actually peaceful. And as long as people are not engaging in violence, not mm. using intimidation. Yeah. Um, is that that's the limit, right? Is, you know, when words uh, lead to violence or imminent, uh, uh, you know, threats. That are, yeah, but that but yeah. we have to be very very careful to right. define that very oh, narrowly, no, like well, Brandenburg. Yeah, yeah what, but. what I was going to say is like it, you know I think most people who believe in free speech agree with that, but that is never easy to know in the moment. But it's interesting because we have speech in our culture all the time mm. that calls for violence. We say let's go bomb Iran, yeah. bomb the shit out of Iran. You know, when Trump was running for president, he said I'm going to mm -hmm. bomb the shit out of Syria and Iraq. Obviously, yeah. that's a call for violence. We've had at every pro-Israel protest. People saying, let's turn Gaza into a parking lot. Gaza should belong only to the Jews. Let's drive the Arabs out or kill them all. Speech I don't like, but is clearly protected. So to suddenly now say, oh, if you're chanting from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, that that's the kind of imminent call. I mean, what Brandenburg basically said was, you know, the the, the remember the, the defendant Brandenburg was a KKK leader who stood up in a speech and said, if the government doesn't stop being as anti-white as they are, we're going to engage in violence and vengeance against them. And he was convicted under a terrorism statute threatening the use of violence for political change. And the court and Brandenburg reversed the conviction and said, no, you are under the First Amendment allowed even to defend the abstract justifiability of the use of violence. That's how our country began. The only thing you can't do is say, gather a mob on a corner with torches and say, go burn down that house yeah. where you're where you're encouraging and directing a crowd imminently within right. like the next several minutes. That's the only exception. Any other kind of political speech is clearly protected speech. And I think one of the things we all have the obligation to do is to make sure when we look at the views that we absolutely hate the most, that we think are the most offensive, that we force ourselves to defend the, that principle, look for those cases and defend the principle in that case, because that's the only way that principle will be finally consistently upheld. Yeah. Can I ask, you were raised Jewish? Yes. Yeah. And were you bar mitzvahed? No. Okay. Um, it, how do you, how is your Jewishness part of your kind of ideology or foreign policy, things like that? How did does it factor in? I mean, being you know, being Jewish um, has, I think, a lot of different meanings. Say, like you, sure. you can there, you you can call someone a Jewish atheist, and no one's mm -hmm. confused. No one thinks that's an oxymoron. Right. Whereas you couldn't call someone a Christian atheist. People would be like, "How can you be Christian and an atheist, right. um, or a Muslim atheist?" Those are pretty because the idea of being Jewish is not just a religious identity; it's a cultural identity. It's arguably even an ethnic identity. I mean, mm -hmm. the way Jews Jew, to be Jewish is defined is that you have, are born mm -hmm. to a Jewish mother, and then you're automatically a Jew no matter what your views are. So you grew up in, 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 and I grew up, you know, surrounded by Jews. My grandparents uh, were, all four of them were Jewish. My grandmother, my maternal grandmother was a refugee from Nazi Germany in the late 1930s. And so all the values of Judaism were instilled in me in a lot of different ways. Now, I think one of the things in adulthood that you should do is go back and examine the views that with which you were inculcated from birth to make sure that you're arriving at those views, not because you were indoctrinated to believe them, but because you've arrived at them at, with your own critical faculties. But I think there's a lot in Judaism that uh, is about the values of defending 
the weakest against the most powerful when the weakest are being abused, when that power is being abused against them. Um, I think you've seen a lot of Jewish activism based around those values. To me, being Jewish has never meant, especially being a Jewish American, has never meant having fealty or loyalty to the foreign government in Tel Aviv, let alone mm. refraining from criticizing it, especially since it's my government, which is the United States, not Israel, that finances that military, that pays for its wars, that risks. So I, I don't think, you know, I think it's so important. I, I, at the last night's debate, yep. I was accosted by these angry Upper West Side Jews, like really angry, who, I mean, I guess it's the Upper West Side, you know, it's New so York. So they weren't angry, they were just from the Upper West Side. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and yeah. Jewish, uh, yeah. Israel supporters. But, uh, you know, they kind of came up to me and said, how can you be a Jew and be saying these things about Israel? And I said, mm -hmm. like, honestly, I, I consider myself a Jew, but I don't feel one of my obligations is to support a particular foreign policy or support a particular foreign you country. You do believe Israel has a right to exist. I mean, I think the concept of a right to exist for any nation, mm -hmm. I think, is, is, is a difficult one. Like we were talking about last night about, you know— um, Changing the government, Iran. Does Iran have a right to exist as an Islamic state, which is mm -hmm. what they are? Um, you know, most countries' boundaries are artificial. People can debate those right. things, but I certainly, I don't. One of my goals is not to eliminate Israel as a Jewish state. I understand the importance for world Jews of having a state, but it's important to recognize that it is an ethno state. The idea of it is that a certain group of people will remain the majority, will remain supreme. You know, we talk about white nationalism being evil. We talk about other forms of ethno-nationalism being evil. It is a form of ethno-nationalism, but you know, I think the idea is that the Holocaust was such a momentous, recent event that in order to feel safe, Jews have to have a certain part of the world, a very kind of small sliver of a country where they will always have refuge and remain the majority. But I don't think it's some kind of sacred idea that can't be debated, but it's not one of my goals to eliminate that. I don't think it's realistic, and it's not part of what... I'm trying to do. How do you think uh, the current war between uh, Israel and Gaza will will it end soon, and will it end? Will it lead to a better world or a worse world? I mean, you know, I remember the first <clears throat> October seventh was a Saturday, so the first time we had a show um, on Rumble where I, we have a nightly show where I talked about October seventh was Monday, October 9th. And I spent a good amount of time saying, I know you, I have a lot of Israel critics in my audience, but here's an argument, not just a passing cursory claim about why you can't justify what Hamas did. Hmm. But just like you couldn't justify what 9-11, what happened on 9-11, even if you understand the grievances and the motives that led to them. But then I went on to say, like, the, I think it's so important that in this rage and anger about what happened, that we not make the same mistakes as we made in 9-11, where we think that you know, just kind of out of anger and rage and a desire to avenge what has happened, we just start launching kind of reckless and indiscriminate military force without any real plan about what it's going to actually achieve. And I think that's exactly what happened. They know they want to kill a lot of people in Gaza. I think a lot of the people in the Israeli government believe Gaza belongs to Israel, even though in international law they don't. They want to drive out the Arabs or at least control it the way they control the West Bank. But I don't know. I don't think anybody in Israel knows what the outcome is. I mean, who's going to govern, you know, Gaza if you don't have Hamas there? So to me, it seems like a war that especially now is driven by a lot of bloodthirsty desire for vengeance, which maybe you can look at the atrocities of October 7th and kind of understand. But I don't think it's a geostrategically justifiable Ward, especially given the number of innocent people dying from it. When you say, uh, if not H Hamas, who would govern Gaza, uh, the Arab barometer just before October 7th actually published results of a survey where Hamas was wildly unpopular among Gazans. So one would assume there are Gazans who could govern who would not be Hamas. They're not, I mean, they may have been unpopular before Israel started you know, doing yeah. what basically destroying, but I mean, and every time you have a war, you drive the population into the arms of the most extremist people who are vowing to take revenge. And so I don't think we know what Gazans uh, think because we haven't quite seen a destruction of a civilian infrastructure on the level of what we've seen. The, there were more bombs that were dropped on that densely packed population of Gaza, half of whom are women and children, in the first week of the Israeli attack than were dropped 
by the United States in Afghanistan for the entire first year of Afghanistan. There are no hospitals left. There are no universities left. There's no healthcare functioning left. There, there, 70 percent of residential buildings are unusable or destroyed. These people have been in refugee camps for seven months with no one in sight. So to say, oh, I know what Gaza is. They don't like Hamas. I, I doubt that we can possibly discern that. And, you know, the last time there was an election in Hamas was two thousand in Gaza with 2006 and Hamas was elected. Right. With a lot of violence attended and stuff. I guess we don't need to talk, you know, uh, on and on about that. But it, it strikes me also that, you know, does Hamas bear any responsibility for Israel's invasion of Gaza? Of course. I mean, yeah. if you go and attack a country and kill a bunch yeah. of, you know, there were a lot of game playing with the numbers. It turned out that about 600 civilians were killed. The others that were killed were active military, but a lot of them were killed in brutal ways. They were targeted. So, of course, you're going to expect retaliation from any country. I think, number one, you have to look at the context, though, yeah. of like, you know, three months earlier, before October 7th, Israel was bombing Gaza. There's been a blockade of, on Gaza. The Israelis run all of Gazan mm. society. They determine what comes in, what comes out. They bomb the airport. They don't allow anybody in or out. They're trapped in this tiny little open air prison for two decades. I think any country would be pretty angry toward mm. um, a foreign army that was controlling every aspect of their life. So there's a context there. But I think the other point, Nick, that we have to focus on, because I think everyone has yeah. their opinions on is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, is that we, the United States government, pay for, we finance Israel's right. military, we finance their war. We constantly isolate ourselves from the rest of the world to shield Israel diplomatically. We are sacrificing all of our standing in the world and all of our soft power. So many votes at the UN have been the entire world in favor of one thing and the US and Israel standing alone against it. And this is something that the United States has been suffering from a lot, this idea that we can just go around the world financing whatever wars we yep. want, launching whatever wars we want. This is something we talked about last night. Without the world, which is now a multipolar world, increasingly China right. is a serious competitor to U.S. power. Without the rest of the world right. getting resentful and angry about what it, what is what is your overarching foreign policy? I mean, I think there's uh, you uh, veer into libertarian territory a lot when you talk about foreign policy, particularly the United States and its projection of military force. Certainly, what you know, what should how should the U.S. conduct itself? Yeah, I mean, if I had to pick, and I'm not pandering yeah. here, but if I had to pick one major political figure of, say, the last 20 years who most articulates, best articulates my view of foreign policy, it would be Ron Paul, mm. um, because he has such a stable, fixed, value-based vision, which is we should not be fighting wars unless there's a country that is attacking the United States or about to attack the United States, that there are few things that degrade our country more and the citizens who live here than this constant massive financing of this gigantic military. We pay you know, more in our military than the next for 15 countries combined. The last time China fought a war, was 1979. 45 years ago, it was a one-month war of, with a border dispute with Vietnam and Cambodia. And in that time, you almost can't count the number of wars that the United States has fought. We're not only constantly fighting wars where our national security isn't at stake, where we're trying to change the world, change governments as we've been doing for a long time, but we're financing all kinds of wars as well, right. like the one in Ukraine, like the one in Israel and many others. So, you know, I think that at some point we have to ask ourselves, what role do we want to play in the well, world? So what role is it? So it's not as a uh, kind of military uh, adventurers. It's not as people funding wars. Uh, do we... Do we make distinctions between countries that are better and worse? Do we have actual alliances? Do we treat them differently by a trade policy and things like that? So th we touched on this a little bit last night. Like the thing that I think irritates me the most is the fact that there are still Americans who are willing to believe that the reason we go to war is because we oppose authoritarian countries and want to save and spread democracy to other countries. The exact opposite is true. That's a nice fairy tale. But in reality, like in the real world, U.S. foreign policy, a staple of it since the end of World War II when we were fighting the Cold War and then the War on Terror, has not been to spread democracy. It's been to overturn democratically elected governments, to impose dictatorships on countries precisely to ensure that the sentiments of the public do not find expression that those dictatorships that then rely on us or rely on our support, rely on our military, do our bidding. Um, our closest allies in the Middle East are not democratic countries. They're some of the most savage ty tyrannies on the with planet, the including Saudi of, Arabia and with Egypt. With the exception of Israel. Right. I'm not saying yeah. we don't have any yeah. democratic allies. Yeah. Um, 
we have democratic allies as well in Western Europe and the like. All I'm saying right. is we don't care at yeah. all no, if a country stability. is dictatorial yeah. or, or democratic. Right. We're very happy to have countries that are dictatorial. In fact, we've taken democratic countries and made them dictatorial um, so many times. You know, I, I live in Brazil. In 1964, yeah. there was a democratic elected government. The Kennedy administration and the Johnson administration warned them, you're going a little bit too far to the left. You're doing uh, rent control. You're doing uh, land disbursement. You seem like you're a little bit leaning toward Moscow. And if you don't stop, um, we're going to remove you from power. They didn't really stop. They wanted to keep you know, out of the Cold mm -hmm. War. And then Lyndon Johnson worked with right-wing military generals in Brazil to impose a military dictatorship for the next 21 years that removed democracy from Brazil. And we've done that over and over and over and over. Mm -hmm. um, and not just back then, but but still, right. including the, the change of government in Ukraine in 2014. So I think it's so important to recognize the actual role that we're playing now. It's mm -hmm. not the question of, oh, should we keep doing what we're doing of you know, saving the good governments and spreading democracy? Mm -hmm. Or just minding our own business. The reality is we're we're interfering in countries constantly, not for their interests, but for our own. And I think that the United States government and the American people would be far better served basically having a military designed to protect our country. Um, that and, I I agree with, but then you know that doesn't explain the the that's not the limit of what America would do, right? We're going to have a lot of impact and influence just through trade. Our, our economy is larger than anybody else. Well, I mean, I think that, China so. is the example. I mean, yeah. China is obviously an authoritarian country. I wouldn't want to live there to put that mildly. But the way that they have accumulated power yeah. has not been by invading other countries. They're not engineering coups in other countries. Um, you know, we constantly hear that they're the aggressor. But if you look at a map about where American bases are, they're completely mm -hmm. surrounding China. There are no Chinese bases surrounding the United mm -hmm. States. Um, because their view of the world is we don't care what other governments, what kind of other governments other countries have. Mm -hmm. We just want to trade with them. Um, they care if other countries and try to interfere get, in their yeah. in their country. That's the one thing they, right. they do care about. Um, but I remember there was this video that China produced when we left Afghanistan after 20 years and the Taliban marched right back into power. And they kind of did a mocking video of our foreign policy. And they said, hey, while you were fighting all of these wars and spending trillions of trillions of dollars, we spent $800 billion on this incredibly efficient high-speed rail that connects our entire country and improves the lives of our citizens in all sorts of ways. And I think, you know, there's a tiny segment of the American polity that benefit from these wars, arms dealers, the U.S. security state. And everybody else suffers. Um, none of these wars is in the interest of, of the American people. There's no conceivable way to make that connection. Um, and all you have to do is look at China as a way to consolidate power and have influence in the world and trade with everybody. You know, there's a, there was an African president who said, when the United when China visits us, we end up with a hospital and investment in our infrastructure. When the United States visits us, we end up with a lecture. And I think that especially for people worried about China or worried about American power, so much of the reason China has grown so much and is more influential is because of the resentments that are growing against our country for the belief that we can just bomb and attack right. and start wars whenever we want. Uh, you mentioned uh, Brazil. Uh, you obviously you live there. Are you a, a citizen there or... No, I'm an American citizen okay. and have permanent residence in Brazil. Um, libertarians have been very interested in Brazil in recent years, and obviously you're you're more on the you're, you are on the left there as opposed to I guess uh, where the libertarians end up. But part of it, uh, one of the reasons uh, people uh, libertarians in Brazil, you know, often point to the idea that Brazil is always the country of the future uh -huh. because it never quite gets there, yeah. and it's really hard to do business. It's really hard to get anything done. How much of a of a meaningful critique of Brazil and other parts, per, and maybe this might be a leap, other parts of Latin America is that? And is that going to foment a kind of libertarian, like a reduction in state power so people can actually get on with the business of living? I mean, it's, I think it's a very complicated question. I don't pur purport any kind of expertise at all in macroeconomic questions. But what I will say, having been there for a long time and been very involved in the politics. My late husband was a member of Congress. Um, I've done a lot of reporting there. Uh, is that the number one policy that Brazil, the number one problem that Brazil faces, like pretty much every country in the region, is a brutal, severe inequality, an economic inequality of the type even unimaginable mm -hmm. here. Kind of poverty that is so soul crushing. And there's no uh, class mobility. There's no economic uh, mobility. If you're mm -hmm. born into the lower classes, you stay there because right. you have no opportunity. And there's a tiny section of it. Brazil is a not a poor country. It's a rich right. country with the majority of its citizens living poor. When 
Lula da Silva, who was always considered this kind of, he, you know, he was never a Hugo Chavez, he, he was never a communist, but he's kind of a social democrat leaning to socialism. When he was elected in 2002 after trying for three times and, and failing because of fears that he would be too radical, that he would turn Brazil into Venezuela, he presided over the greatest economic growth that Brazil had ever seen. They went from the 12th biggest economy in the world to by the time he was done, the sixth biggest economy. When he left, he had an 86% approval rating. And in part, it was because he grew the richest part of society, but then did some mild to significant distributive reforms, mm -hmm. you know, like payments to poor families contingent upon proving their kids go to school and get health care and vaccines mm -hmm. and the like um, that got praise even from like the economist and neoliberal. So I think you know, a hardcore neoliberalism or libertarianism that says the government's pulling out, might work in some places where you have kind of a basic safety net where people, but when you have tens of millions of people living in a kind of crushing poverty, the idea that the government's gonna pull out the tiny little subsistence mm -hmm. that they have um, in the hope that 30 years this libertarian nirvana will come mm -hmm. and make everybody rich, um, you know, I think that has a lot of humanitarian challenges to it. Yeah. Um, does Malay in Argentina, is he having a spillover effect in Brazil or are they pretty separate? Sphere. I mean, basically, and like, what, do you, what do you think of Malay? Well, yeah, basically, like so many countries, Brazil is now utterly polarized. Like there's mm -hmm. no more center right party. There's no more center left party. Um, there's a hard left and then there's a hard right represented mm -hmm. by Bolsonaro. Um, and in Argentina, I mean, it's so interesting because a lot of these new right figures, including Trump mm -hmm. and like Marie Le Pen, Marie, when Marie Le Pen ran for president in France, she ran to the left of even the Socialist Party, you know, wanting to right. raise the retire, lower the retirement age, um, preserve social benefits. When Trump ran in 2016, he swore that he would never touch Social Security and right. Medicaid. And so you have these new right presidents who are very nationalistic, saying close our borders and give more benefits to the citizens of our country. That's kind of the new populist right mm -hmm. view. You have Bolsonaro, who never believed in that he was very libertarian in his economics all these poor people need to have their policy you know their programs cut they're lazy they're dependent on the state it's dragging their country down and now you have like a dogmatic libertarian a real libertarian like a very a, a libertarian that would fit well into reason or the cato institute um who really is a big believer in libertarian economics mm -hmm. he's been in office four months let's see how that yeah. works but um you know, uh, his foreign policy seems pretty conventional. That mm -hmm. happens a lot with these right-wing leaders. But economically, I think Malay is one of the purest libertarian mm -hmm. uh, newly elected presidents of a major country. And that's going to be a real laboratory for how libertarian economics work. Um, what about uh, Bukele in El Salvador? He's presided over uh, a massive decrease in crime, but he also has, by all accounts, has arrested a lot of people and not necessarily been that careful about you know, whether or not they're guilty of anything. That's or, putting or it very even, generous. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So well, how, do, how do, in uh, particularly in countries with big gang problems and big uh, street crime problems, uh, how should civil libertarians think about somebody like Bukele? Well, there's the famous founding quote of the American Republic that it's better that 10 guilty people right. go free than one innocent person be wrongfully convicted. Unless that person is Donald Trump, right? Yeah, yeah, in which no. case you do yeah, everything yeah. possible to right. make sure he's in prison as the only chance yeah. for the Democrats to win. But other yeah. than that, um, you know, they say that if you turn on like MSNBC and CNN, they'll say like, mm. yeah, Biden's behind. But the one chance we have, the polls mm. show, is if Donald Trump's in prison by the time of the election, maybe enough people won't mm. vote for him. That's what their main political strategy is. Maybe it'll get thrown to the House of Representatives. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, I hope libertarians are always cautious of the idea that we give up basic liberty in exchange for security. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Brazil probably has the single greatest problem with drug gangs and militias. Mm -hmm. In fact, in Rio de Janeiro, where I live, um, the government, like the official government, controls maybe 30% of the city. You have these two parallel governments, the mm -hmm. drug gangs and the militias, who control 70% of the city. And you basically negotiate with them like you do a foreign country because in order to put ballot boxes there in the election, you have to have a good relationship with them. You have to give up, you know, make promises to them. It's obviously a, a, a very entrenched problem. But when the government has tried in the past to just use that kind of violence that, for example, is being used in El Salvador, 
you know, they end up turning the entire population against them because they go indiscriminately killing people. Mm -hmm. They put massive numbers of people into hideous prisons, a huge number of whom are innocent. And I will never accept the idea that destroying civil liberties in the name of security um, is a worthwhile trade-off. Um, let's talk a little bit about drug policy. One of the first times we talked, you had written a report on Portugal's drug decriminalization for the Cato Institute. Do you keep up on drug policy and how, you know, in countries where drug cartels are very powerful and entrenched, you know, they oftentimes, if not always, are the, the people who are the fiercest opponents of drug legalization or decriminalization. How do you think uh, things are going in terms of war on drug issues and how does that intersect with these other questions about American influence? Uh, you know, the U.S., has demanded over the past 70 years, really. You know, they've written all of the international drug treaties. So, um, you know, how, how does this play out? I mean, to me, like the war on drug debate is the, the easiest way to think about it is to me, alcohol is just another drug. Um, and we tried banning it mm -hmm. in prohibition and everything went wrong. I mean, it led to very violent gangs that were trafficking alcohol illegally. Um, nobody was drinking less. Um, it didn't achieve any of the benefits and created all these massive harms. The reason why there were shootouts in the street was because now suddenly alcohol was illegal. It used to be you went into a store like you do now and buy it. There was no need for, for, for alcoholic gangs. And the parallels to drug gangs seem so obvious to me. And I remember when I went to Portugal, because uh, I remember someone at the Cato Institute, Tim Lynch, I was at an event at Cato and he said to me, oh, do you know that Portugal in 2000 decriminalized all drugs, not just marijuana, but all drugs. And I said, no, I didn't. He said, yeah, nobody knows about this. And he asked me to go to Portugal and research it. And I went there. And you were like, oh, all right. <laughs> yeah, no, I was like, send me to Lisbon on yeah. the next fight, actually. Right. Um, and it was fascinating um, because the reason Portugal decriminalized all drugs was not because they were like some socialist left-wing mm -hmm. haven. It was because throughout the 90s, there were nothing but heroin addicts laying on the street and they were desperate. Like the more they criminalized, the more money they spent on police efforts, the more addicts there were, the more criminal, you know, all the harms associated with drug use were increasing sexually transmitted diseases, uh, deaths, all of that crime. And that of desperation, they wanted to try something different. They really wanted to decrease, they wanted to legalize drugs. Um, but I remember the Portuguese saying, we're a small country, we actually have to abide by conventions and the US government would not let anybody uh, legalize it, but they were, they were allowed to decriminalize. And at least when I went there in 2008, at first there was, when they were considering it, a huge fractious debate about, you know, some of the Catholic uh, sectors of the political life in Portugal were opposed to it on moral grounds. Conservatives mm -hmm. thought it was going to create drug tourist havens in, in Lisbon. None of that happened by the time I was there in 2008. There was no more opposition to drug decriminalization. You looked at every metric and everything improved, including overall drug use. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the thing that, you know, the, what you have to do, though, is you have to pour resources that you were spending on imprisoning drug addicts or small-time dealers and police and catching them and processing their courts. You have to then create, you know, rehabilitation centers. That was why it was working so much. Then the population no longer fears the government because the government's not there to say, we're going to put you in prison. They're saying, we're going to offer you help. And there was money for poor people to go into rehab mm -hmm. and get counseling. And a lot of them got off drugs. And that's why drug use decreased overall. And then a lot of those addiction problems fell. This has kind of fallen out of favor in Portugal, but only because they stopped funding the parts mm -hmm. that were necessary. There was a push in the U.S. as well in places like Portland in, in Oregon mm -hmm. and others to try and start, de obviously, in San Francisco and other places in California. And there's this conception that, oh, well, it doesn't work because you have now. Mm -hmm. all the, the problem, though, is that there's no funding of health uh, you know, programs right. that were designed to treat it like a disease instead of a crime. And so if you just strip all the money out of everything, including law enforcement and the public health side, of course you're going to have addicts laying on the street. And that has discredited a policy that if it's tried and implemented well, like Portland, Port, like Portugal did for a while, I think still has great promise. And I mean, I don't know of anyone who would say that war on drugs has been successful. I've never heard anybody claim that. Uh, let's talk about the 2024 election, I guess it is. It's, you know, time marches on. Yeah. What for you is, a, what, what's the best case outcome for 2024? 
I mean, to me, you know, the benefit of Trump has always been that he is a disruptive force. It's why the establishment is arrayed against mm -hmm. him. He raises a lot of claims and a lot of views that have never previously been part of mainstream political discourse. Mm -hmm. Things like questioning why we're in NATO, mm -hmm. given that the whole point of NATO was to protect Western Europe right. against a Soviet Union that no longer exists. Questioning um, the regime change wars that we've mm -hmm. done, running against both the Democratic and Republican parties, pointing out that Washington is a swamp on a bipartisan level. You know, he ran more against Republican dogma than he did right. against Democratic Party dogma and won. The problem was is that he had zero discipline, zero follow through. Yeah. All you had to do was flatter him and people like Mike Pompeo and or mm -hmm. Nikki Haley ended up in positions of power who have, you know, the exact kind of views that he claimed to despise. And there was almost no follow through. Nonetheless, just the mere disruptive force, um, I think, can have benefits. The problem is that as a personality, he just suffocates everything to such an extent. Okay, so then what, what does that mean? Uh, does that mean, you know, have uh, game plan it out? What, you know, what's the best? Outcome? I mean, I generally think that when you have both parties kind of incapable of doing much, um, because you have a Republican in the White House and yeah. Democrats, can, that's always the best. Yeah. Um, but I don't, it's so hard to game out with Biden's melting brain and then mm -hmm. Trump's um, kind of just extremely inconsistent views of everything. One day he's angry at this and the next day he's angry at that. It's very hard to so give do a you have like a analysis. guest room? Do you have a guest room in Brazil is what I guess I'm asking. Uh, uh, what do you, just very quickly, what about RFK Jr.? Does he hold anything for you? Why or why not? Uh, not really. I mean... I'm glad that his COVID questioning is in play. We absolutely need a full-scale re-examination of what happened there. Uh, and by that, do you mean you don't believe in vaccines like him or that we need to think about the way public health uh, is kind I mean, of I mean, I think that what happened, I, I took the vaccine, my kids took the vaccine. I think um, that we know that so much of what we were told was either mm -hmm. false, inaccurate, sure. or a deliberate lie. And lockdowns were completely arbitrary, driven by something other than... And mass didn't something. work. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the question of whether it was from a lab or from mm -hmm. natural occurrences is a question that, you know, Fauci got all those emails from people, scientists saying, mm -hmm. it looks to me strongly like it came from a lab. And then a week later, right. they were signing a Lancet letter saying anyone who says it came from a lab is mm -hmm. defaming the Chinese and spreading yep. disinformation. So there's a lot of answers to a major worldwide pandemic we don't have the answers to because it was basically banned to offer any mm -hmm. dissent at the time. And I think that's why we need to revisit. And to the extent RFK Jr. does that, I think he's bringing something positive. Great. Okay, let's uh, go to questions, and I will insist that it be a question. So, Nick, would you share a topical uh, philosophical teaching that you revere? And Glenn, would you advise if a person living in prison serving a conviction would be able to pardon themselves if they were elected president? Okay, why don't we start with you? Why don't could start Trump, with you? Could Trump, I'm trying to remember what he said, I kind of had a... I mean, I have he to wants to know a, a, a philosophical thought that has been influential for you. But if you want, I'll, I'll go so you can think of yeah, your answer. Please, since you. since that's really yeah, what you're so doing. I, yeah. um, so can Trump pardon himself? I think, I mean, yes, for sure, under the law. I mean, I don't yeah. think there's any question that constitutionally there's no limit or exception really? to the so pardon he power. Could, if he gets, what if he gets convicted before he's president? You can okay. then become president yeah. and, 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 then, and, and uh, wow. pardon prior crimes. I mean, the pardon power is extremely important. Like the idea is that, you know, the branches are supposed to check each other and the justice system, mm -hmm. the judiciary constantly hands out unjust prison yeah. sentences or convictions that are unjust. Obviously, there's something extremely bothersome about a president mm -hmm. pardoning himself since it kind of makes him immune from the law, at least mm -hmm. while he's president. Um, but constitutionally, he certainly can do it. I don't mm -hmm. think anyone questions that. That's why they want to convict him on state charges where it becomes much more difficult. Um, I will just very quickly say I'm always a fan of uh, people reading Arthur A. E. Kirch Jr.'s The Decline of American Liberalism. It was published originally in the mid-50s, updated in the late 70s, and it's just a classical liberal reading of American history as a constant kind of pull and push of the forces of centralization and decentralization. It's very unique. He was uh, E. Kirch was a longtime critic of militarism in American life, but it's just a fascinating 
uh, way of looking at American history. Next question. Uh, are there any Gaza-related protests in Brazil? I, I, I was there on 9-11 and it was surprising. And as part of the same question, uh, the protests in United States, how much of it is genuine sympathy for the people in Gaza? And how much is it an outlet for um, pent up dissatisfaction with the Biden administration or establishment in general? We hear chanting, we are not freeing Palestine, Palestine is freeing us. Or something. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, Brazil's relationship to the Israel-Gaza war is kind of interesting because Lula has always been this kind of unorthodox voice, kind of trying to kind of be a bulwark against Western imperialism. For example, when the war in Ukraine started, he said he thinks Russia and the West bear 50% of the blame each because the U.S. blocked diplomatic mm. uh, solutions and it was the one who riled Zelensky up saying, oh, you should fight mm. this war when he said, I don't mm. think we can win because we'll give you all these arms. When I'm just explaining, but, uh, somebody I'm invaded just explaining the Lewis. other country, right? Yeah, but yeah, I mean, okay. a, a but, much, much bigger okay. and stronger country yeah. invaded a much smaller and weaker right. country, and maybe in the nice world, Ukraine would win. But like, right. that's not how wars are determined, and that was why there was an, uh, an encouragement to, you know, get Russia to accept a solution where, get um, Ukraine to accept, where something. Zelensky would have said, "We'll be a buffer country. We're not yeah. going to be part of the West. We're not okay. going to be part of NATO." Anyway, so he. He speaks out that way, um, and he has been highly critical of Israel, accusing uh, Israel of genocide. There hasn't been a lot of protests, though. The protests come from the Brazilian right, and I think it's such an important point. The Brazilian right is obsessed with Israel, even though I doubt a single Israeli can place Brazil on a map or cares at all about Brazil. The Brazilian right thinks Israel is one of the most important issues. The day after Bolsonaro got elected, which is an incredible victory for someone of his background, the first thing he did was get on a plane and fly to Jerusalem. Hmm. He got baptized in the Jordan River. He met with Israeli security officials. Every single Bolsonaro right-wing march in Brazil has more Israeli flags than hmm. Brazilian flags. And the reason I think is so interesting, it's because they're largely evangelical and for religious reasons venerate Israel, hmm. but also because they love Israel's security model hmm. and their kind of animosity toward the Muslim world, but mostly hmm. for religious reasons. And I think oftentimes it's assumed that the reason the U.S. is so steadfastly pro-Israel is because of the influence of American Jews, their financial influence and the like. That's certainly part of it. But the reason, a big reason now, is there are a lot of evangelicals in the Republican Party, and they will tell you, like, I think Israel is the chosen country. Right. The Bible says so, and they need to be united and protected. And they think for a lot of religious reasons that will happen. So I think it's important to understand that dynamic um, for why Israel is That was so certainly more explicit, really, in the late 70s and 80s uh, among uh, American evangelicals who really believe we are about to enter the end time. Right, but if you go to the Republican <clears throat> caucus now and you ask yeah. people, like, you say you're America first. Like you said, you only mm -hmm. want to have the government paying attention to American interests. So why do you want to fund Israel? They will tell you it's for religious yep. reasons and biblical reasons. Yeah. Uh, next question. Hey there. So question for both of you guys. Um, early on when you guys started this out, you guys were critical of journalists, uh, critical of the companies behind them, critical of journalist culture, critical of social media. But do you ever think the problem with journalism and media is the consumer itself, the people. Like just a personal example on YouTube and TikTok, I've had you know probably about two billion views covering news in the last three years. And doing it, I've just noticed the dumbest headlines are the ones that get millions of views. Like three weeks ago I did a video that was called that was about China disrupting the movie industry in America. That has twelve thousand views. That same week I posted a video about Zendaya having a three-way in her new movie that has four point five million views. So do you think people are the problem and they're just that maybe dumb? Sounds like people know what they want. I don't know, you know, but um, do you want to insult your audience? Well, I mean, I will, no, I will say that, um, and first of all, insulting your audience yeah. is a really important part of maintaining integrity in your yeah, journalism. That's right. Yeah, um, yeah, I think, yeah. you know, one of the dangers of independent media yeah. is if you rely on subscribers and mm -hmm. supporters there's a tendency to want to tell them what they want to hear. We yeah. lost like 20% of our subscriber base during, uh, after October 7th, because I knew a lot of people in the audience were steadfastly pro-Israel and I wasn't going to ignore the issue or, you know, but I have a platform where I can do that. But I think a lot of independent media is, is imprisoned and captive to their own audience. And that's a problem. But I also think along the lines of what you're saying, 
I think it's, I don't think people are just so dumb that they can only process pop culture and not political issues. I think so many people have disengaged from the political process. I mean, mm -hmm. the biggest group of voters in the United States are non-voters, people who just don't think it matters at all and it's not even worth getting up and getting into their car and going to vote because the outcome never matters for them. So I just think a lot of people, you know, um, just don't care about politics, don't want to be involved in it, have have this belief, this very cynical belief that it has no effect on their lives. And I think that's also a problem. You know, it's also interesting, <clears throat> excuse me, to think about the New York Times, you know, the ultimate mothership of kind of legacy or establishment media is essentially subscriber. It's a subscriber newsletter now. It has been for a while. And uh, it gets more money from subscriptions than from advertisers. And that really changes the way that you kind of conceive of the news and dish it up, right? Because Yeah, they know they have all know, liberal anti-Trump subscribers, and you know. so they're going to be very cognizant of not alienating them. But actually, I mean, the New York Times is a good example for all the you know way that people hate the media. There's still like a small number of large media corporations like the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, that are succeeding massively. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're basically now monopolies eating up all the smaller hours. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of interest there in consuming kind of the vegetables of news. Um, but I think a lot of people have cynically disengaged, and I think that that's a problem. Thank you. Next question. No, 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 no. no. Hi. <laughs> you run a tight ship. <laughs> Hi, so my name is Siobhan. I Hi. did independent journalism around like anti-COVID policies and lockdowns, and on the subject of RFK, I want to know, how do we stop funneling people back into the two-party system, and where do I send them? How do mm -hmm. we take this energy and move it outside? I think the uh, Guantanamo Bay is still... Uh, and that's, where, no, the, that's no. where they'd like us to go. I don't know. Okay, so thank you. No, that's a great... I mean, when Nick asked me about RFK Jr., yeah. uh, I interviewed RFK for like an hour and a half, I don't know, several months ago. Um, and I found him reasonably interesting, but the reason I'm not so excited is precisely Did because our system. Did he take his system, shirt off at any point and do push-ups? Because that's. I'm surprised because he would have, probably would have assumed that that yeah. would have made me and my audience like him more. But no, he kept. He was fully clothed. Um, but he has done that a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. And he also the Falcon. On other shows. And like he was giving away uh, tickets where you could be in a sweepstake and go falconry with. Yeah, I think he was reading too much about the Kennedy mystique and yeah. being good looking as a part of political. I want to play touch football with him and Patrick Kennedy. I yeah, mean, it's like on. you're 70 and yeah. congratulations on being healthy, yeah. but try and keep <laughs> your shirt on. Um, but no, I think the, the reason you can't really get excited over it is because the system is yeah. so... I mean, he's not going to be included in the debates, for example. So the two parties are constantly colluding on how to keep uh, every everyone else out. And I think the only option for a third party is if you get a billionaire who can self-fund. Um, we saw that with Ross Perot, who was able to just through financial force kind of insert himself into the election and had an impact on it. Um, but it's hard to think of other examples because they, the two parties work so closely to keep that duopoly intact. Do you think that we are in a uh, period, though, where what the, re you know, the Republicans and Democrats are both losing market share and mind share and, and kind of commitment, and what they stand for seems to be up for grabs? I mean, the Trump Republican Party is radically different than the Mitt Romney one, and something similar seems like it's about to happen with the Democratic Party. It may not mean that there are, you know, suddenly four or five parties, but do you think in recent, in, you know, in, in the near future, we're going to be talking about a Democratic and a Republican party that, that represent very different coalitions. Than oh, that's have. already, I mean, the working class has migrated away from the Democratic yeah. Party to the Republicans, whereas the Democratic Party is the party of financial elites and affluent mm -hmm. suburbanites. And even you're seeing that now on a racial basis as well, where mm -hmm. obviously a large number of Latino voters right. have migrated to a Republican party. Um, you're seeing a lot of people in the black working class, you mm -hmm. know, being very you know, alienated from the Democratic party. I'm, I, I'll be shocked if 20% of black voters vote for Trump, but that's what the polls are showing. Clearly, he's bringing yeah. more and more racial minorities into the Republican Party. And if you listen to like the smarter, younger, newer Republicans like J.D. Vance or Josh Hawley, they'll mm -hmm. tell you that the future of the Republican Party is a multiracial working class party, which when have Republicans said that? Right. But that is clearly what's happening. You know, but at the end of the day, they're just kind of switching voters, right? And, um, you know, you there are a lot of countries where you have multiple viable parties and you listen to their political debate and they're so much more nutritious because you have so that's not going to happen in the u.s though just historically we always have two major parties but what has to happen for people to become more interested in politics you were talking about you know many people have tuned out because they're like either this isn't going to help me or it's just irrelevant what 
I mean, beyond kind of creating a more coalitional politics, what what might happen? Yeah, I, well, you know, there have been uh, politicians who have been charismatic enough and kind of able to sell themselves well enough that they brought in, I mean, a, Obama brought in a yep. ton of new voters. Um, and Trump did as well. Yep. And Bernie Sanders had a lot of people yeah, voting yeah, Democrat. Ron Paul as well. Yeah, right. exactly. So yeah. if you can convince people that we need even there's older like a, people to come into politics he, and bring energy and excitement. Yeah, or right? just yeah. anybody who can convince people that they're actually something new. I mean, the problem yeah. is people have gotten their hopes up about so many new yeah. politicians who end up being exactly the same. Mm -hmm. um, tons of black voters who voted twice for Obama refused to vote for Hillary, and they right. interviewed and did polls and said, now that you know Trump won, do you regret not voting? And they say, no, absolutely not. Hillary mm -hmm. would have done nothing for us. So I think the more kind of disillusion and disappointment, the problems get worse. But if you have somebody who can convince people that they will actually change their lives for the better, I think that's one way out yeah. of that. Uh, next question. Um, hi, so this is back to your discussion about parsing out kind of truth and fiction and media and journalism. And I was curious to what extent you thought that social media might be influencing or perhaps causing people's distrust with um, journalistic corporations, then how algorithms in particular might be complicating the question of what is truth and fiction to an individual? No, I mean, I think social media is, as you suggested, is the most important tool for convincing people that establishment forces lie to them all the time because it's the one place they can hear dissenting views. And the reason there's such an effort and I think this is the most important development over the last seven years is at, in, after 2016 happened, when first the British people decided to leave the EU by enacting Brexit, and then four months later, Donald Trump beat Hillary Clinton, two huge traumatic blows to kind of liberalism writ large in the West. What they concluded was that they can no longer allow the internet to be free because when it's too free, they can no longer control how people are thinking as evidenced by those two elections. And I would throw in Macron's rise in France, also kind of putting a little bit more fuel on that. Yeah, and well. the disappearance of these center left, center right yeah. factions in favor of more populist mm -hmm. left wing and right wing parties. I mean, the establishment is scared by the when people are free. And what happened after 2016 is there appeared overnight this new fake fabricated expertise called disinformation experts. Like, I don't know where that credential comes from. You know, like, it, like it's like if you go and study medicine, you're obviously more capable of operating on people than people who didn't. If you're a pilot, you can fly a plane. But, but like, there is nobody more capable than anyone, other, anyone else of just decreeing what is truth and falsity in general. But they've created this industry, and this industry is often funded by a handful of small billionaires, by security state agencies, and by big tech that's designed to distort political censorship over the internet, purging dissent, and give it the kind of uh, facade of this apolitical scientific judgment by calling it disinformation. And exactly because of what you said, that social media has been so powerful in undermining faith and trust in institutions, they're doing what all establishments do, which is when there's a new weapon that is developed that can threaten establishment power, they try and commandeer and seize it. And that's why I think a free internet is the single most important cause. And thank you. Uh, this is the final question, sir. That's a lot of pressure. A lot of pressure. Yeah. yeah. So you guys had mentioned the student protests earlier and kind of contrasted them against the 60s. Glenn, do you think there are differences in, in maybe degrees of legitimacy between the current student protests and, and the protests from the 60s? It seems like there's kind of an assumption that because we're students and because we're protesting, we're kind of inherently in the right. So do you see there being... And what, what metric of legitimacy are you using? I was going to leave that open to you. I mean, I think it's hard to, I mean, I think if you all, if I, at least when I was, I'm still very young, but I mean, when I was even younger, <laughs> um, you know, there's like a naivete, you know, like you think you can just, you know, see justice and injustice. You kind of think in black and white terms. You know, you want to go and fight establishment power. Or you want to, you know, engage in activism. That you want to skip things. class. Yeah, Not exactly. An, it's I a mean, lot these, more fun. These no. things, they never camp in the middle of winter right? right, or right. at the end of the fall term. Yeah, but like this is now a sustained yeah. protest movement. These A lot of these people have been threatened with expulsion and arrest, mm -hmm. have actually been expelled and arrested. There's a lot of authenticity, I think, to it, a lot of self-sacrifice. These are not just whiny, entitled kids like running away at the first sign of um, any kind of problems. And I think we often romanticize the past like, oh, the 60s, they were the real protests. The ones we have now are a bunch of whiny babies. 
But I think in the 60s, what motivated these students was hearing about and seeing the carnage that we were creating in Vietnam and the disgust from it. And they wanted that war to stop. They wanted the government to re remove itself from this war. You know, again, I've talked to a lot of protests. I've visited these encampments. Um, and I hope people go watch these interviews because they're rarely heard from, but they're very smart. They're very um, well-spoken. They're thoughtful. They're not like, you know, just spouting cliches, leftist cliches or whatever. They talk about what they've been seeing in Gaza and the reason why they're so bothered and concerned about it. And I think on some level, you know, of course, young people are stupid, like they're dumb, you know, they're not sophisticated, it takes a lot of life experience, but, but at the same time, that energy is very healthy for our society. Like you want a sector of society that's pushing back that way, that's disrupting, that's protesting. Um, even if they don't always use the best tactics and say the smartest things. Um, again, I'd rather have young people engage in activism than just being completely apathetic and careerist. Uh, as a uh, final question to you, uh, Glenn, you are a member of Gen X, correct? Okay. You were yeah. born in 1967. <laughs> that kind of disinter mild disinterest is very Gen X. I way. used to like that, and now yeah. it hurts more. But so, it's fine. Um, do you uh, do you agree that we will never have a Gen X president? Right, we've never had one. Um, was DeSantis Gen X? Is he Gen X? Or? If, yeah, he's if Gen you X, want, right? I'm sure millennials say, are probably like, no, no, he's Gen X. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I actually think that, I don't know if you saw yesterday, but Biden gave one of his like most drooling, incoherent, like uncomfortable to and watch. By the way, we can, you, don't, you can just say it's his most recent speech. Right, exactly. Yeah. exactly. It was like a new level. He was even yeah. reading from a okay. teleprompter at the White House. Yeah. And like you couldn't understand. Remember when the media, <laughs> when people started noticing this? And the media was like, no, no, he just has a stutter. Yeah. Like this stutter that yeah. no one ever saw for six decades in point of life. And they were like, no, there's nothing wrong with his brain. He just has a for stutter. For me, it was when he uh, referred to somebody as a lying dog-faced pony dog or pony soldier. Yeah, somebody who like challenged like, him on Iraq or okay, something. Okay, this is, uh, you know, we got to get uh, Noam Chomsky to do the universal grammar on that. Right, exactly. You can't really, yeah, trace it. Um, so... Yeah, I think that uh, that's obviously something that, you know, imagine what that's going to be like in two years and four years. And I think, you know, a lot of Americans have difficulty understanding like very complex policy issues. But most of us have had the experience where we have an old person in our life and uh, we can recognize the decline. And I think people see it. And I wonder whether people are finally sick. We have, we have, we have a gerot uh, gerotocracy. We used to call the Soviet Union that were like all those Brezhnev like leaders were all in their 70s. Ours are all in their 80s. And I do think there's this sense of like we need younger people. Maybe too young is distrusted. But yeah, I think Gen X is a perfect generation to find the losing. All right, well, we're going to leave it on that. All note. right, thank you guys very much. It's been so good. Right on. Yeah.